Meanwhile, in Russia, the president is on a charm offensive. Vladimir Putin is hosting the Russia-Africa summit. The first edition was in the year 2019. It was held in Sochi. It is Russia's largest resort city. What's happening now is the second edition. The theme for this year is peace, security and development. And that's what's on the agenda. Growing cooperation, promises of deals, security guarantees, all with a sprinkle of geopolitics. The summit started with a bang. Putin's first promise was free grains to Africa. We will be ready in the next three to four months to provide for free to Burkina Faso, Zimbabwe, Mali, Somalia, Central African Republic, Eritrea, with 25 to 50,000 tons of grain, and we will ensure free delivery of these products to consumers. Now some context here. Ukraine accounts for 9% of global wheat exports. This grain makes its way to markets through the Black Sea. In July 2022, Russia and Ukraine struck a deal. It was called the Black Sea Grain Deal. Ukrainian grain would reach the world and Russia would not attack the ships or stop them. That was the deal. But last week, Russia walked out of this deal. And since then, global food prices have been on the rise. Africa too was alarmed. The continent depends on much of this Ukrainian grain and rising food prices do not bode well for its leaders. They could face protests or worse. So Putin is now making up for that. He's promising to cover up for Ukrainian grain and he's offering some of it for free. Our country can replace Ukrainian grain both commercially and as free aid to the poorest countries in Africa especially as we are again expecting a record harvest this year. But grain wasn't the only thing on the mind of African leaders. The other issue bothering them is the Wagner Group. We've told you about the coup, how their leader challenged Vladimir Putin and got himself exiled. Now, the fighters are all over the place. But in Africa, Wagner has a considerable presence. They're seen as an extension of Moscow's influence. Africa relies heavily on the Wagner Group. They provide security in exchange of gold. So this will be an urgent issue for African countries, countries like the Sudan, Mali, Libya, and the Central African Republic. And what does Russia have to say? Well, the same old. Wagner's work in Africa will continue as usual. But Moscow doesn't say who will be responsible for their actions. I guess that's up to Africa to figure out. There were also some promises of financial cooperation. Listen to this. In order to further expand the entire range of trade and economic ties, it is important to move more energetically in financial settlements on trade transactions to national currencies, including the ruble. So grain, security and money. That's what the summit focused on. But was that the real aim of this extravaganza? You see, Putin is isolated on the global stage. He waged a war last year, and since then, the West has shunned him. So he's looking for alternatives and pockets of support. He wants to exert his influence in Africa, and how will he do that? He cannot travel to Africa. There's an arrest warrant against him from the International Criminal Court. Flying down would be a risk. So Putin chose the second best alternative, which is inviting all of these leaders to Russia. In fact, it was a perfect opportunity for him to hold center stage before all these African leaders. But the guest list might be a dampener. Putin expected a full packed auditorium. What he's got is a lot of empty seats. 49 African delegations were invited this year. Only 17 RSVP'd. It's a sharp fall from 2019 when 43 leaders visited Russia. And what explains this dwindling guest list? Moscow blames the West for it. It says Western nations tried to sabotage the event. I have the statement from the Kremlin, the Kremlin spokesperson. And this is what he said. Virtually all African states have been subjected to unprecedented pressure from the U.S. And French embassies on the ground have not been sleeping either, along with their Western missions, who are also trying to do their bit to prevent this summit from taking place. So Moscow says African countries were subjected to unprecedented pressure. But is that really what's happening? The Ukraine war has divided the world. Countries were quick to choose sides. Africa did not. It has been mostly neutral. African countries did not want to get drawn into a Cold War-like situation. They wanted to avoid camp politics. Also look at Russia's footprint in the continent. It has a high profile, yes, but not enough investment to show for it. In 2019, Putin vowed to double bilateral trade within five years, but that's not happening. 
Trade is stalled at $18 billion per year. Foreign direct investment is abysmally low and Russia doesn't offer much aid either. So while Putin's African dream promises may sound impressive, his USP is diminishing. There are other compelling dreamers in the mix, the likes of China, the United States and France. They're all vying for influence in Africa. And they're also pumping in a lot of money. Putin knows that a few favors here and there are crucial to secure trust. Thus the free grains. But will he be able to match up with investments in the long run? Will his promises hold up? Or will they just disappear like a mirage in the Sahara? The Pacific Islands are having a busy week. French President Emmanuel Macron is in town. He's on a five-day visit to the region, and he's currently in Vanuatu. It's a country in the southwestern Pacific Ocean, Vanuatu. Its population is around 330,000. Macron was given a traditional welcome by the government there. He attended a cultural event. He held talks with Vanuatu's prime minister, and then he dropped a statement the kind that you expect newspapers and channels to pick up immediately. The French president said, there is a new imperialism in the Pacific. Listen to this. A new imperialism is emerging in the Indo-Pacific, particularly in Oceania. And a logic of power is threatening the sovereignty of many states, the smallest and often the most fragile. So what exactly is Macron talking about? You see, the Pacific has become a battleground, a new battleground. It has traditionally been America's backyard, but in the last decade or so, China has made giant strides. So now it's a race. This month, China signed a policing deal with the Solomon Islands. Before that, the Americans struck a deal. They signed a defense agreement with Papua New Guinea. In fact, Joe Biden's top officials are in the Pacific right now. Foreign Minister Antony Blinken is in Tonga. Defense Minister Lloyd Austin is in Papua New Guinea. But which side... Is Macron on? You would think he's with America, but he isn't. The French president is offering a so-called alternative. He says he's against hegemony and confrontation. So he's pitching the French way. The question is, can he back it up? France does have presence in the Pacific Ocean, and I do not mean warships or aircraft carriers. France has sovereign land in the region. New Caledonia, French Polynesia, and Wallace and Futuna. France owns these territories. Around 1.6 million French citizens live here. Their exclusive economic zone spans almost 9 million square kilometers. My point is, France is a Pacific power, which is also why Macron's declaration is problematic. Yes, there is new imperialism in the region. America is taking over military bases. China is taking over policing duties. But what moral ground does France have? These specific territories are vestiges of French colonialism. Some of them have tried to break free. In 2021, New Caledonia held a referendum. Around 96% of the population chose to stay with France, stay with France, not break free. There are pro-independence groups, but they boycotted the last vote. So before talking about new imperialism, maybe acknowledge the old one. President Macron has not described his specific plan in detail, but there are three broad themes. One is more political and military engagement. Two, more development aid. And three, help against natural disasters. You see, Pacific Islands are on the front lines of climate change. It is their most pressing problem. But why is Macron pitching an alter alternative? Would it not be easier to join the Americans? Well, technically, yes. But there are two reasons why Macron is going alone. The first is AUKUS, the submarine alliance between Australia, the UK, and the US, AUKUS, AUKUS. France was supposed to be building the, these subs for Australia, but that deal was snatched from them. And what's worse, there was no heads up. The announcement was a total surprise for France. And since then, Macron has pursued an independent Indo-Pacific policy. He's even reached out to India for that. So that's one reason. The second reason is more elaborate. French leaders, including Macron, are not happy being junior partners. They have bigger dreams. Call it Napoleonic tendency or strategic autonomy. But that is the truth. Meet Charles de Gaulle. He was president of France in the 1960s. His policies were aimed at creating a supranational Europe, not a lackey of the US, 
but a counterweight. That's what he wanted. He wanted to create a European army. He also downgraded France's membership in the NATO. In 1966, France exited NATO's military command structure. They joined, they rejoined rather, only in the year 2009. So France has always had big ambitions, but Macron is cut, and perhaps Macron is cut from the same cloth. He has also proposed the creation of a European army. In the month of April, he had some tough words for the US. He said, Europe cannot be America's follower. So the intent has been there, not just now, but even 60 years back. Which brings us to the question, what is holding France back? Well, in Macron's case, it is politics. He is an embattled leader at home. He has been pushed from one protest to another. In such situations, you cannot really spend much time on foreign policy. That is one problem. The second is the lack of economic heft. France's share of the global GDP is just 3%. The U.S. makes up 24%, China makes up 18%. In fact, Germany, Japan, India and the U.K. rank above France. Does that mean Macron's specific push is doomed to fail? Well, maybe not. His talk of a middle ground will attract attention for sure. If you align with the US or with China, the risks are higher. They may talk about peace and strategy, the US and China, but let's be clear, both these countries want staging grounds in the Pacific. No one is asking the Pacific countries what they want. Do you know what they want? Climate action. They need funds knowledge and resources to tackle climate change. It's a pressing issue for them, an existential issue. It's way more important than Taiwan or the South China Sea. If you can give them that, you can build lasting partnerships. Our next story is about the global arms bazaar. It could see a shake up soon. New challenges are rising to take on the incumbents. Tonight we focus on South Korea. South Korea wants to be a major arms dealer, and today it took one step closer to that goal. A South Korean firm has won a contract. The name of this company is Hanwha Aerospace. It has won a deal to build infantry fighting vehicles. And who is the buyer? The Australian Army. They will pay at least $3.4 billion for 129 infantry fighting vehicles. This is one of the largest projects in the history of the Army. The cost will be subject to detailed negotiations, but is expected to be between five and seven billion dollars. Now this is a big deal. It's been called a historic agreement, and I'll tell you why. It is for the first time that an Asian company has bagged a defense deal from Australia. Although Hanwha Airspace is not a new player, it is South Korea's largest defense contractor. And this was not an easy bid to win. There was another formidable player in the mix, Germany's Rhine Metal. Again, a well-established player. The bidding went down to the wire. Australia's opposition personally endorsed Rhine Metal, the German company. But Canberra decided to go the other way. And they realized this might not sit well with Berlin. Rhine Metal said it was disappointed. An Australian minister tried to contain the damage. He said, Australia will keep talking with Germany. Let me quote from what he said. <clears throat> We'll continue to engage with the government of Germany on that. We are very hopeful that will continue. And that may continue. But in this round, Berlin has lost to Seoul. A few years ago, this would have been hard to imagine. Australia choosing Asian weapons over Western hardware. But it's happening. This deal signals intent. South Korea wants to become a major arms supplier. In recent years, there have been a bunch of big deals. In 2021, Seoul's defense exports doubled from about $3.2 billion to close to $7 billion, 2021. Then 2022 was a banner year. Do you know how much business South Korea did? Last year, they earned more than $17 billion from weapons exports. So the sales doubled again. And let me say this, Seoul is not even selling weapons to Ukraine. South Korean weapons have their own market. How did this happen? How did South Korea take this lead in the global arms bazaar? Well, this is a story of self-reliance. South Korea began building up its defense industry in the 1970s. The decision was primarily driven by fear. Seoul was worried about the North. It wanted to keep its guard up against Pyongyang. It also did not want to depend on powers like the US all the time and beyond a point. So the government invested in defense sectors. Weapon makers were given generous loans and tax breaks. 
a new industrial policy was introduced. It encouraged development of sectors which promoted the concept of dual use, meaning technology that can be used for civilian purposes and for military. These were areas like steel making, shipbuilding, and electronics, dual use. All of them have military applications. And that's how South Korea built up its defense industry. Now they're making money off it. Korean K-2 tanks, Chunmu rocket launchers, K-9 self-propelled howitzers, and the F-A-50 fighter aircraft are much sought after in the international market. And which countries are buying these weapons? The Philippines, Indonesia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Poland. Hanwha Aer Aerospace, the company that just bagged the deal in Australia is a giant. It is well known for its howitzers. These guns command a 55% share of the global market, 55%. So South Korea is a serious player. And also a good case study for India because Seoul is on course to becoming a formidable competitor for New Delhi. You see, India too is trying to ramp up its defense exports. And Korea presents a challenge. I'll give you an example. Earlier this year, Malaysia announced a deal. It decided to buy 18 South Korean fighter jets. The deal was worth $920 million. Guess who else was trying to bag it? India. New Delhi had made a pitch for the Tejas. These jets are made by the state-owned company HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. And India's pitch was quite attractive. Reports say, along with the jets, India also offered to set up a maintenance, repair and overhaul complex. They also offered aviation management courses. And they were ready to sign up to make some parts of the jet in Malaysia. All of it was on offer, but the Malaysians were not sold. To them, the Korean offer seemed better, and they took it. And to be honest, India still has a lot of catching up to do, but they must do it fast. You see, the global arms bazaar is opening up. There are more opportunities than before. And there is space for countries like India and South Korea. They provide effective weapons, comparable technology, at competitive prices. But there is less time to fully capitalize on this opportunity. If India wants to compete seriously, it must watch out for the Koreans. It's been six years since the Me Too campaign. Six tumultuous years. In this time, we have called out sexual harassers. We have unmasked dozens of predators. But how many have we punished? I ask because of the Kevin Spacey trial. The actor has been acquitted by a court in London. He was accused of nine sexual offenses by four men. All the cases were in the same period, from 2004 to 2013. But the jury did not convict him. They found him not guilty of all the offenses. So Spacey walked out a free man. He says he's humbled by the verdict. Listen to this first. I imagine that many of you can understand uh, that there's a lot for me to process after what has just happened today. But I would like to say that I'm enormously grateful to the jury for having taken the time to examine all of the evidence and all of the facts carefully before they reached their decision. And I am humbled by the outcome today. Kevin Spacey had been accused by around 30 men. Not all of them went to court, 30 men. Those that did had multiple allegations of groping, of drugging, and of assault. Spacey denied all of it. He said the accusers were out for money, but he did admit to two things. One, that he was a quote-unquote big flirt, and two, that he often made, and I'm quoting, often made clumsy passes, whatever that means. The accusers did testify against Spacey, but the jury was unmoved. They declared him innocent. There is already talk of him making a comeback. You see, when the allegations emerged, Kevin Spacey became kryptonite. No one wanted to work with him, but now he's plotting a return to mainstream acting. Johnny Depp did the same after his domestic violence case. So tonight we're asking an important question. Have courts failed the Me Too movement? And Kevin Spacey is just one example of it. African comedian, American comedian rather, Bill Cosby, was accused by 60 women, 6-0. In 2018, he was convicted in jail for 10 years. 
It was seen as a huge moment in the Me Too campaign, but the joy did not last. In 2021, that conviction was overturned. Bill Cosby walked out a free man. Another example is Mario Batali. He's a celebrity chef in the United States. He was charged with sexual assault in 2019, but last year he was acquitted. The situation is no different here in India. The conviction rate in crimes against women is just 26%. One out of four accused is not convicted. Only one is convicted, in fact. If the accused is powerful, he can do a lot. Intimidate his accusers, bribe officials and judges, even slap defamation cases against his victims. This is the unfortunate truth of Me Too cases. They've shaken our collective conscience. They've also exposed the true face of powerful men. But when it reaches court, it's different. Take a look at France. Only 14% of rape allegations led to jail time. Only 14%. Between 2019 and 2020, the number of convictions, in fact, declined. By how much? Almost 31%. What explains this trend? Why do Me Too cases fail in court? There are multiple reasons for that. One major reason is the type of legal system in place. Western countries use a jury system. Ordinary people are constituted into a panel. This panel will decide whether the accused is guilty or not. It may sound like democracy and justice, but not every case is easy to understand or decide on. Some of them are complicated, like Me Too cases, very complicated. Do jurors understand the concept of power disparity or the idea of consent? Maybe some of them do, but we live in a politically charged world. Me Too cases have become legal and political flashpoints. So using juries may not be ideal. The second reason is time. Accusations have emerged or often emerge after years or decades. So evidence is hard to get. In such cases, it becomes a he said, she said situation. The Kevin Spacey case is one such example. As always, the court believed what he said. A third reason is the way our police and courts are designed. They're not sensitive enough. They're not concerned about why this movement emerged. Hence all the acquittals. And let's be clear about one thing. An acquittal does not mean the accusers lied. It does not mean the Me Too movement was a farce. It means our legal systems need an upgrade and, and an urgent one at that. Imagine a survivor reading about these repeated acquittals. It could traumatize women who have come out. And it may also scare away women who haven't. So our courts and laws need a reboot. But until then, what can we do? For starters, do not rehabilitate these people. We've seen Me Too accused return to mainstream jobs as actors, as businessmen, as journalists, and as politicians. And this is a dangerous trend. You're putting more women at risk by rehiring these predators. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with the United States. A burning crane came crashing down from a high-rise in Manhattan. The crane was carrying 16 tons of concrete, two firefighters and at least nine other people have been injured. Meanwhile, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell just experienced the longest 19 seconds of his life. So did everyone else in the room. No, they did not do a plank together. McConnell went abruptly quiet in the middle of a news conference. Everyone was confused. He was then escorted away. And when he came back, he said he was fine. In London, tiger cubs had a fun time in a zoo. They soaked in the sun, chilled on a swing, and called it a day. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1953, the Korean armistice was signed, ending the three-year-long war. The Korean Civil War began in 1950. The three-year-long bloody struggle left millions of people dead. The two countries never really signed a peace deal. So they're technically still at war. With that, we call it a wrap. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. week.
been good bipartisan cooperation and a string of uh, uh, okay, Mitch. Anything else you want to say? I'm sure let's go back to it. 